So I just want to say something real quick before Carmelo starts. So, um, so these guys are my babies, you know, um, and I, I'm gonna, you know, I'm leaving you in incredible hands here today. Um, thank you all. Um, for the patients because of COVID and everything and waiting to get this thing rescheduled and all the, um, but uh, and thank you for being here. Absolutely. Um, so remember, shit's not going in the Louvre, okay? <laughs> so let's just have fun, yeah. relax, okay? And try not to beat yourselves up. So, yeah. all right. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you, David. Carmelo? Yeah, well, welcome everybody and thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Carmelo Blandino, as you know, I paint uh, flowers, large botanicals. Uh, I've been doing that now for, since 2002, is uh, when I made a switch in my life and my career. And uh, so, I guess it's been about 25 years now, something like that. Uh, so, I originally started painting landscapes uh, up in Canada, and I was painting in uh, a medium that was very difficult to handle, which I absolutely loved, which was encaustic painting. And that's basically where you have uh, beeswax and you, you melt the wax and then you add pigment to the wax and you, you stir it up on these ovens and everything is hot. And you grab the brush and you paint with the paint as it's hot. So you literally have about three seconds between the heat and then touching your canvas and then it, it freezes and hardens. Right? So you have to move very, very quickly. So I learned, I learned to paint, I taught myself to paint in that way. Uh, and it was a great experience because what it did is it immediately loosened me up to the dynamics of being able to think fast, work fast, and having an immediate result. So once you, once you touch the encaustic on the, on the hard surface and it, it, uh, it basically hardens, you're stuck with it. So you have, to, you have to be really determined on your stroke. And the way I would move the paint around is I would have a hot hot gun and I would remelt it and I'd start moving the paint. So normally in cost if you work flat, I work on the surface like this, I would set the challenge. So I'm continuously challenging myself, but remember this. And you know, if it's, what, this is easy, this is harder, I'm going for the more difficult one because the learning curve is much higher, much faster. Okay? So pretty much this is how I've been running my, my, my work. And a lot of the things that I've been doing have, have been Sort of my philosophy and my approach to things is like, yes, there's a certain structure to, to painting, there's a certain structure that you follow, and if I were to break that structure, what would happen, and then uh, where would that take me, all right? So my methodology of thinking, and I sort of want you to understand this, if, you, if you're outside the perimeters of that, in the next three days I'm bringing you into that perimeter, into the perimeter of this is challenging. It's meant to be challenging. This is hard. It will be hard. It's supposed to be. So you don't get discouraged. You're in the zone. Okay? You're like, oh shit, I can't take this anymore. Right? It's <laughs> two days into it, and I'm like, no, that's exactly where you want to be. After that, after the next three days, you're, you're going to take all this information and you're going to practice with it at home. And there's going to be a certain release of that tension and the understanding. But that comes with practice. Okay? Uh, with that being said, you're, you're going to be guided, you're going to be given a lot of tools and a lot of information, a lot of tricks uh, to help you overcome all of this. So it's not, it's not discouraging, it's certainly not. Um, so from, from the encaustic, I then moved into uh, oils. And the, uh, the oil painting was something that I had touched upon, but I never got really, really deep into it. And one of the challenges that I had with that um, was that the oils, uh, because I work really large format, the way David does, you know, we're talking five, six foot canvases. And normally in a space like this, I would have a lot of them lying around at the same time, and these things are all evaporating at the same time, right? So I worked with heavy turquinoids, and I, heard, I worked with, um, you know, basically, um, what we use, like uh, poppy seed oil or linseed oil, oil, right? And, and so when I had all these around the studio and it's evaporating, right? So all these toxins or fumes are going up there. My brushes, my brushes are, have always been these type of brushes. So there's been a lot of movement of paint. And at a certain point, I had to stop working that way. Just for health reasons. So I looked at that and I said, we have to find a different solution. So I, I had created a large series of um, paintings. Um, uh, there, if you look at some of my work, it's called the Meditative Series, and I did these large format, single flowers, 
Uh, and there was sort of like a light coming from the center, and, and, and there was a movement like this that just kept moving and would come to the outside of the periphery of the canvas. And those are meant to be contemplative, meditative uh, series that if you, once you have one hanging on your wall, you connect with it, and it was mostly made for meditation to sort of give a very zen feel to the room. And um, I myself, I, I wear my art on my sleeve. I was going through a process in my own life. Um, and your pants. And on my pants. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. I wore my queen shirt today. Um, and so I was going through a process in my own life, and a lot of times when um, whatever it is that I'm going through, I put it onto the canvas. It's my, my way of just processing. So it's not just about learning the technique. It's also about telling my own personal story. Okay? And, and the personal story about the artist, and like, everything I'm telling you, use it, <laughs> okay? Use it. When you're painting and you, you, you've overcome your technique, you, your next step should be, what is my story? What am I trying to tell about me? What am I trying to tell to the public about what, you know, what's going on in my life from my perception of things? So at that point, I went into a very heavy uh, meditation. Um, um, I had gone to, uh, um, obviously, for a divorce. I said, okay, I have to re-center myself here. And to the art, I started studying uh, Buddhist, Buddhist meditation and uh, Eastern philosophies and Taoism. And all that information got channeled right through me into the painting. And uh, I was working consecutively for over a year just doing this kind of thing, like this, right? You're all familiar with that. <laughs> Small brushes, and then you know, I used to get up and walk over there because the canvas is large and you look at it and then you come back like that. And it, was, it was painstaking, it really was. For me, my mind, because my, my mind kept wanting to race this way and my practice, just like meditation, kept bringing it here. So I knew what I was doing. It was like, the mind would go here, I'd like, you come back here, you come back here, until I got it. Until it was just, I would never think about what I was going to paint. I would just show up into the studio, just like you show up for life and you deal with whatever's on your plate. So I would show up to the studio and I'm like, okay, let's go and get into that. So some of these paintings would take about a week or two to, to, to create. Still working fairly rapidly. And I began to introduce spray paints into, my, into those paintings. All right, so in an effort to speed up things, I wanted the oil to dry faster. So I started to think, about what, what is there out there that I, if I combine the oil with this medium, would speed up the process of drying? And it was spray paint. And so I, just, I, I went in search of um, the, the flowers, I'm, I'm, bear with me, the flowers had this sort of configuration on the inside, like a doily, uh, sort of like there were flowers on the flowers. So if, if I painted a big gigantic peony like this, within there there was like, um, how many of you have gotten really, really high? <laughs> okay, nobody has. <laughs> So basically, basically the matrix, when you start to get into, uh, when you start to see, <laughs> you see the fragmentation basically of, of the breaking down of the reality, right? So you start to see all those fragments, and I started putting those in there as little flowers. So there were flowers on top of flowers, creating an even bigger flower, okay? So that's how I'm trying to express these. So it started from here, and that point would just keep going and going and going. In an effort to save myself time with all of that, I, I went in search of uh, lace. Now you know how lace tends to have these little flowers that are sort of crochet. So I would take these large pieces of lace and I put them down on my canvas. Then I grabbed my spray paint and I would spray it wherever the lace was. As I removed the lace, wherever the paint penetrated, right? Well, that imprint was left there, right? So that was that was my that was my drawing. I started drawing with the lace. I started directing where I wanted the lace to go. I would just spray paint it and remove it. And then I would see that. But what happened is that the oil paint dried instantly. So the combination of the now don't try this, I'm just telling you what's going on, okay? <laughs> so the oil paint dried instantly with the spray paint. So again, I pushed the boundaries of something that was more traditional and I introduced something non traditional into it, okay? And so it, it led me to this understanding that I could work with oils, I could work with spray paint. But the problem again was the toxicity level on those things. I mean, you have to wear a mask, and it was an open studio, thank God, I had a big garage door like this. The toxicity level was high, so I said, you have to change this. So, I was back home in Montreal. Uh, I had to go visit my parents, so I went back to, to, to the house where I used to live. 
and I set up a little studio there. I was going to stay there for, for a couple of months. Um, my father had had a stroke. I said, I'm going to stay here and uh, just be with the family. And one day I woke up and I walked, walked into the studio and um, I didn't have any materials. And through the meditation, again, the question was asked. I asked, you know, the universe, I said, what have I not seen come out of my body yet? Like, what have I not created yet? What medium have I never painted with? And so, like in a flash, the answer was, you've never painted with acrylics. You've never seen what your work would look like if you were to paint in acrylics. I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. And you've never painted with your left hand. I'm like, oh shit, now that really doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, I'm up for the challenge. Let's do it. So literally what I did is I went to the, uh, to the art store and I bought like, tons of paints and tons of brushes that I sort of was used to working with already. And um, I brought these back into that studio and I actually kept my right hand behind me. And then I started to, I purposely refused to use my right hand. So everything that I did, even just opening this, became left-handed, with tape, left-handed. It's almost like I, I lost, I just pretended my limb was not there, right? Music and Derulo, that's all right. Dance party break. Yeah. Can everybody do this? We're good. So, so I actually, what I did is I actually um, held my hand back and, um, and I began to pick up the brush and I, 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 even, I was not even able to mix, I was sort of mixing. It really was, it was like a, discovering a whole new world. So, you know, it, was, it wasn't, it was kind of surreal at the same time because what was happening is that my, um, my left brain synapses were firing like crazy because it's saying, use your right hand. And my left brain was like in, the, in child mode. It was, it was back in kindergarten. And then I knew it. I said, here I am, I'm back in kindergarten. I'm going to be painting like a child. Right? And so that's exactly what started to happen. And so as I was picking up the paint, it was very awkward movement. I could do like this. Like today, I'm just like, you know, no problem. I got this. But back then, I'm like, I'm like forcing. You felt, you, felt, you felt the disconnection between the left and the right. right? You, you pick this up, and this, this was dormant. Because this part had been trained to the point that was so meticulous, just like you, where you're, you're able to do this, and everything is coming from here to your right, right? And you, you feel the brain, the brain starts to fire differently. So with the repetition of that, continual repetition of using my left hand, uh, eventually they started to, one started to subside, and they weren't fighting anymore. Now they were in coherence. And I became ambidextrous because of it. Now I'll, I'll pick a bolt and I'll paint the bolt. So the right hand comes in when I want some detail. The left hand is the childlike performance. Comes in and says, "Well, man, you a little too serious here. Let's, let's, let's have some fun, right?" So the child is always there, always looking in the studio. And along with that, um, listen and watch my whole my whole new career as as a floor artist in acrylics. And, and you know, you, you, you don't know what's going to happen. You just kind of know you need to do this. And as you do it, uh, suddenly, you know, you start showing these pieces and people are like, wow, that's, that's really different. But I like it and I like this and I like that. And then the pieces just start to move. And as, you know, obviously as sales would come in and accolades and people would start to appreciate the work, it would encourage me to keep doing more. And of course, then I just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Always using my left hand, and when the trigger would come in to use the right, it was kind of like quitting smoking. You know, you have that urge for the cigarette. Yep. Right. Okay. Get off. <laughs> so you're basically no, no, not going there. Not going there. I can't. Not today. Um, and and so I really started to realize that um, we're all living with the source good personality of an artist within us. Hence, why all of you are here today, wanting to learn how to use the you know to get looser and the so basically, everything that you've been doing up till now, sorry David, I have to say this, everything you've been doing up until now, you need to do the opposite, okay? You're going to have to, especially with pros, right? and you are, you're going, you're going from a medium that takes a very long time to dry into a medium that takes a few minutes to dry. You're going from a medium that allows you enough space and ample time to have to think about it, now you're going to a medium where you have no time, it's like you respond, so you have to respond. So then. What happens with the response? Where's the response coming from? Think about it, right? So, well, think about it. 
reflect on what I should say, because what I'm about to say is contradicting what I said. The response comes from the heart. So you're, right now you're all in your head. Everything is in your head. You're, you're sitting there, there's music playing, you got the whole setting all set up for you, and you take just a little bit of paint, and then just a little bit of oil over here, and then you mix it, and then you're like, yes. Go like this, and go back. <laughs> Curves is like this. The blade is long. Okay. That's the kind of energy that you start to work with. So it's very different. There isn't the passivity that you have. Now it's more movement. And we we're talking about this with David. He works very large. It's very visceral. It's a very physical experience. Okay. So you're not going to try this here because you have your setup, but at home, when, once, when you do have a wall that you can work with, and you're able to hold something at arm's length and then be able to pull back at least six feet, that's going to be your new environment if you're going to work in the products. Okay? But I will show you how to do it, and then you do what you want with it. Um, there is a thing about working with products, the way you work oils. So you haven't really done much. You basically just switch the medium. If you want to loosen up, like I hear all of you saying, I want to get looser with my paints, I want to be able to express myself more, you have to stand up. You cannot work sitting down on a chair. You need to work on a large canvas, and you have to think, you know, it's like climbing a mountain of sorts, or it's a fun terrain. It's like you're, you're in the woods, you're jumping around, you're doing stuff. It's a physical response to the canvas. The physical application comes from the heart. Okay, you cannot be in your head. If you're in your head, you're overthinking it. And there will be moments where look, we're undoing something and then you're, you're, gonna feel, you're gonna feel like you're, wow, look at me, I did it, it's great. Then you gotta go to the next step and I guarantee you, you're gonna get so scared, you're gonna go right back over here again. And I've seen that happen so many times. And there'll be moments where you'll be pushed to, to the outer limit of your, of your comfort zone and you, it's gonna freak you out. You really will freak out. Some of you may even cry. And you're going to be back. <laughs> I've had students walk out of my class. It's okay. I don't take it personally. <laughs> I, I have a lot of Kleenex. Right. Yeah. And maybe that. So, so you're, you're just you're going to you're going to jump yourself back to where you started. And it's just again, the body's response is like, no, I'm not going there. I won't recognize this, this area. It's making me very uncomfortable. Like, screw you, Carmel. I'm getting the hell out of here. <laughs> That's also happened. And then you come right back again with, I'm ready to start again, let's do it, you know. Uh, so, so all that stuff will go through your mind, all right? So, are you scared? No. no. Don't be. Um, I'm just telling you, I'm getting you the pointers of what's going to happen when you recognize those and they come up, remember, you're exactly where you're supposed to be, okay? So why from the heart? Why do I say, how many of you paint from the heart? What does that mean, painting from the heart? You put yourself into your artwork. Yeah, you put yourself into your How? What's your response time? That's a good question. <laughs> yeah. How does the heart think? Quickly. Quickly. How does the mind think? Long game. Long game. Long game. Long game. Yeah. Mind will take it here, 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 and then you're like, oh, okay, I got it. And then you get in there. the heart is boom, like that. So that's where you should be. All right. So that sort of response, you build that, you build up to that. And it's, it's not going to be an overnight thing because you have to reprogram your brain. You've just been trained in this way. Now you've, you've got to be like, what does the heart look like? Well, you know what the heart looks like. Somebody tells us something, you get angry in two seconds. Like, you explode. Or somebody tells us something and you're happy in two seconds. That's the sort of response that happens. The other part of it is this. When you're painting from the heart, the, um, the impetus goes from here right into here. Right? When you're painting from the mind, it goes from here, then it travels down to the heart reluctantly, reluctantly because the mind and the heart are not in coherence. They're, there's this kind of like a battle going on between the two of them. And then the heart pushes it out, but the mind is still connected to it, and it's kind of like a struggle. You have to push this out of the way. Like that's, that, that has to go out of the way. So all my students initially what they do is they actually start to get into abstract expressionism because it allows them to be able to flow just to keep that flow going. And what they do is they do like hundreds and hundreds of drawings on the floor where things are very physical and 
with driving pain, things like that. I'm inspired by this color. Squeeze it too, put it down. All right, well, that doesn't work for me. I'm going to put this color. And then you put that down, and you see? The expression, the movement, the response time, it's, it's faster. This is, this, is how, this is how I work, okay? Now, there are people, but there are acrylic artists who work, lay down their, their drawing, lay down the, the line work, and then they have the reference, and they just, they just follow the reference. Nothing wrong with that, but that's not, that's not the expressive part. That's still being in your head, okay? Any questions? So it's like the heart is, you're just intuitively working and ignoring rules. Mm. So then how, what's the bridge between? You have to make them understand that they're there. The following composition or? The composition is the, the one structure that I'm going to give you that is the head. You just remember that. The composition is the head, it's the heading part. The composition is the part that will give you the structure that you're looking for. But the heart is going to guide that throughout the process. Yeah, because once you say the heart knows right. what it, it's going to feel like. Right. Yeah, the heart, the heart is connected to universal consciousness, right? So that's, that's the part that the brain has no idea. Mm -hmm. And it makes the brain freak out because the brain is all about control. Right. Whereas the heart is all about spontaneity and being connected to something that's bigger than you, bigger than me. Yeah. You trust that process, it's going to give you a damn good painting, right? But part of that is because as humans, we are all, and I'm going to get a little more into another subject here, because it's all interconnected. I've noticed that over the years of painting, there's been a lot of notes that I've been taking down, and there's been a lot of understanding about your relationship with the universe, and the entire metaphysical concept of why we exist is related to the painting. It really sounds weird, but I mean, after looking and studying the masters, and looking at the beach in Caravaggio, and right coming up right up to Van Gogh, and then I jump right into the cleaning and, and I look at all of that. So these guys were completely connected to heart and they were connected to the instantaneous um, language of the, of the universe. Right? So a case in point, Albert Einstein was a brilliant uh, scientist, he was a physicist, and um, he came up with some very amazing formulas. But the one that revolutionized the entire uh, world and, and our galaxy, our universe, was his E is equal to MC squared. It took him less than 20 minutes to come up with that. Because he was actually just sitting there going like this. And then he had, whoa, hold on a second. And that came in an instant. That's the heart. Okay? But then the brain took it and put it into in such a way so it could be used. And that's your composition. Okay? So, and this is basically what's been going on throughout the entire history of art, is that Da Vinci was able to see and understand Chiaroscuro and perspective, because in an instant, that download came in, and then he was able to create the structure so everybody can start to understand it. And that takes time, so that's the head, because then it has to propagate, it has to find its way. And as it finds its way along here, it meets resistance. Then it has to go around this way. But the initial inertia of what needed to be done, I was downloaded in a few seconds. Okay? And, and that, that's what happens in art. So the, the one that you'll see throughout the history of art that really symbolized that very well was Picasso. Okay? Picasso was one of them. Had Picasso not come into art, modern art would not be existing. And the contemporary aspect of how we live today, I truly really believe a large part of that was brought in to him. The Impressionists were another one. Um, the Impressionists were able to take all the structure of academic painting and disregard it. And he worked spontaneously from what was there in front of them. Van Gogh was brilliant at that. Uh, Gauguin was brilliant at it too. Uh, Manet. Uh, Manet was the transition between draftsman, academic draftsman, right into uh, Impressionism. Brilliant also. And if you want to learn about drawing, uh, you study Degas and Manet and they will teach you everything about drawing and painting. And then, um, of course, there was Picasso, kind of revolutionized the idea of like movement, 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 constant movement, respond with the heart, 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 I feel like doing this, I just get up, I do it, boom, it's done, let me go back and have my, my lunch. And that's the way he worked. And that's why he was, I think, he did like over 25,000 pieces, right, in his lifetime, which is insane. In 10 but, years. Hmm? In 10 years. In 10 years which is brilliant. I mean, you think about the amount of work, and there was a lot of repetition. There was a lot of repetition. We repeat, because he never really do a painting and say, oh la la, I have arrived, that is the masterpiece. He would 
David said, that, no, it's, a, it's just something, how it goes. And the Bible of Guernica turned out to be one of the most brilliant paintings he's ever done. I mean, and when you look at the line work and that whole thing and the massive scale of it, I mean, what, a, a, week, a week, maybe a month, okay? And then, you, and then you look at the lasting impression of that painting over the years and why it still impacts us and why it's such an important painting. It's because it was not in his head, it was in his heart. So what happens with the heart is this. I have a heart, you have a heart, you have a heart, you have a heart. All of us have a heart, okay? My communication right now is penetrating all of you at that level, right? If I say something to the contrary of your belief, then we're in the head, right? And you're gonna block me, and you're gonna come up with your concept, and you're gonna come up with your concept. But if I speak at the level of the heart, everybody's in, because we can all relate. And remember that the heart is the center, the epicenter of your universe. It's also connected to our sun. It's connected to the entire universe. And when you speak from here, it hits many more people than if you were to speak from here. You watch some of these talks on, uh, on YouTube, TED Talks, or people giving talk. I can tell when they're headed. I can tell when they're in their head. And they're not really speaking the truth. It's either you know, rehash stuff or something that basically gets picked up somewhere else. But when it's from the heart, you, you can see it's a genuine, it's spontaneous, it's of the moment. So that is, can be translated here when you work, okay? When you work. That, that, that's, that connection can be established. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does? Right, I'm <laughs> and I always say this in the workshops, is leave your brain, your fear, and your ego at the door. Absolutely. Once your ego develops, that's gonna prevent you. That's what keeps you in your head, is your yeah. ego. Yeah, it's leave a it struggle. At the door. It's a constant struggle. Mm -hmm. And so, so what happens is like, you look at an artist like, um, or take Sai Tuanglu, for example, uh, if you're familiar with his work, I mean, he basically regressed. Um, he was a very mature, you know, cultivated man with a lot of intelligence, but his works were regressed in the sense that they carried the sophistication of a five-year-old with these scribbles, right? And his flowers were just painted like somebody paints with their left hand and just does this, and then allows the drips to go down, and allows the drips to fall, and allows the drips to fall. He says, here's your painting. There it is. This is it. How much more do you want from me? This is it. This is what I have for you. Right? So he stops it there. And it's, it's, you know, a curator, a gallery curator, will come in and say, yes, but this one, I don't think it's going to sell like the one, the last one that you did. Can you add, can you put a touch of blue over here? And uh, I actually had a curator that used to do that to my paintings, and I got so pissed off. You know, <laughs> I took them out. Um, so, so, um, so the head comes in. The head, because of the marker, the structure, I want to sell the painting. No, it is out. And one of the things that I always say, and I tell this to my students, is like, the reason you're painting, and the reason you're doing what you're doing, okay, part of it is because you want to learn something new, right? But when you actually start to do the structure of this painting, and you create this thing, there's somebody at the other end of the line that wants it. You won't think about that, do you? Like, you're doing this, everything is connected. Everything is connected, there is no disconnection. So if you're doing this, trust me, it might not be tomorrow, it might be in three weeks, someone's waiting to pick it up. You actually did this for somebody. Because the resonance of what you put in here, if it's sincere, right? This is, this is moving right now, right? This is kinetic energy that's, that's there, it's moving. Right? You did something, there's colors, there's composition, it's alive, right? Somebody's gonna come in and is gonna pick up on that. What's going on and say, that's the thing I want. It's like finding a relationship. Billions of people in the world you aligned with that one person. Why? You know? So the painting is the same way. If you're true to your painting. If you're not true to a painting, it's gonna sit there forever. And when you're not true, it's because you're in here. Right? So another another thing that I learned, uh, I guess I learned a few things along the way. Uh, I used to spend my, my Sundays in New York at the Met and um, that's what I used to do. It was it was a it was a must. It was the Met in Central Park and then just hang out and go to some cafe or something. But the method I used to enjoy is, uh, I went there, I used to do a photography project. Uh, for, I used to put my camera down on the floor, I used to sit down in some of the rooms and I would just quick, 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 run the camera from the baseline over here and pick up whoever was walking. So that was just interesting for me to see how people would respond to the room. And I started to look at um, the, the rooms that I was sitting in and when I would go through the um, medieval uh, areas, people would just be like, oh, they'd be like this, hmm. you know, just walking around. Oh, oh, there's, 
there's a Palama, there's, there's a Caravaggio. Oh, we need to go see the Rembrandt. And so we go, oh, but you can't stay in front of those paintings longer than 20, 30 seconds. It would only speak to you to a certain point. You would maybe the Rembrandt's a little bit more, but they're so hyped up by the history of art that the weight of all that history just over, overshadows everything that's going on in there. But when we would go into the Impressionist room, it was Van Gogh. And there was a crowd of people around the Van Gogh. Just like an incredible amount of people around the Van Gogh, taking pictures, selfies, like cutting off their ear, you know, pretending they're Van Gogh. So they would, not such sure. <laughs> but there were a lot of people around the Van Gogh. And I said, why is that? Why are people around the Van Gogh? So I would get up and I would go study Van Gogh. And I noticed that the spontaneity painted from the heart was absolutely maddening in love with paint. He understood the resonance of, uh, of light. He understood what it did to us as humans and the importance of embedding light within the, within the structure. His compositions were solid. They were playful. There's a lot of playfulness and the light is bouncing all over the canvas like this, everywhere, everywhere. It still had the attraction. And these things are like over 100 years old now, but it was, it was the pieces that got the most attention. And I looked at that, I said, that's because he was sincere. You go on the contemporary modern part of, of the Met, everybody's huddled around the, uh, the Bakunis, okay? And, and the, and the uh, I believe his name is Franz Klein, Franz Klein, the big bold black stripes like this, that would just run across the canvas. Spontaneity, the playfulness of all of that. People would huddle around those. They'd be like, wow, it's just black paint on white canvas, man. Why? Why was that so, like, you have to look at that, right? Why do we have such a response to that? Like, what's it telling us? And again, it's that spontaneity, that playfulness of being able to be the child again. Because Matisse spent his entire life going back to being that child. And at the end, when he basically had no more choice but to mm -hmm. stay put and he was in his wheelchair and he couldn't move, he couldn't paint anymore, well, he used to take paper and cut out the paper. What, what did we do when we were in grade one? Paper. We were cutting out paper, all right? And then we'd stick it down. He, he went back to being a child. There's some of his best pieces. They were large format. You know, he, he put it within the context so that it, it was almost like a poster. It was, it was giant size. And that he was able to communicate that to uh, the people, the childlike resonance. Makes sense? Yeah. What about Colwitz? Kathy Colwitz. Kathy Colwitz documented the uh, Holocaust. I mean, those are really dark pieces right there. Yeah, but how, how long are you going to look at Kathy Colwitz? I guarantee you, not more than three seconds. It's a dark, dark time in our, in our history. But Kathy Colwitz painted from her heart. It was a dark heart. It's necessary. I mean, a lot of my early pieces when I started in 2002, they were dark. One of the first pieces I ever did was dark, second dark, third less dark, fourth less dark. And it's, it's, been, it's been a movement towards... So you got it out? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes they say, like, art is the best way to, to get the stuff out. And it's a way. I mean, you could be doing sports, you could be doing something else. Our medium, in this case, for all of us, is art. It's our language. If you got some stuff that's in you that's dark, show it. Like be honest. Like be honest. Like put it down and show it. Like let's see what's there. And they, once you're done, you're done. Those pieces sold because they connected with people that had that same darkness in them that they wanted to relate to. So I see myself in that. And then once they were done with those paintings, they resold them again, and they just somebody else bought them who needed to go through that process. So everything has has a worth. You see, everything has its value in that sense. So don't think because you're doing dark pieces that A, you're evil, or you have a Satan <laughs> incarnate in it. It's not, it's not that. It's, just, it's a form of expression, and it's coming out that way. Is that what you were asking me about Kathy Pollard? Yeah. <laughs> don't be afraid. So, so yeah, no, it's valid. It's very valid. You see, you see what I'm saying? Um, there's many, many artists that painted uh, dark. I mean, George Gross during World War II, if you look at everything yeah. that he did, Necessary though, because again, it, it, we were going through that period also. Guernica isn't very bright either. Who? Oh. Guernica? Guernica. No, it wasn't bright, but when. No, it wasn't bright. It wasn't bright at the same time. Well, he had, yeah, he had anger to get out of frustration. And he was very angry about that whole yeah. I mean, he was Spaniard too. He was incredibly angry about that. And he insisted on doing it. They didn't want him to do it. And he did it on his own. It was never meant to be in a museum. 
<laughs> you see what I'm saying? It's like, it's, he just did it. So that's part of the process. So, you know, and that's hard. You have to understand that sometimes you also carry it. I mean, it's beautiful when you, when you dispel, you know, the, the, the sort of like the, the traumas that are holding you back from the experience of a, of a higher vibration, if you want to call it that. But you kind of got to go through, through that process to like say, do I still need this piece of coal in there? No, I don't. Let's get rid of it. How am I going to get rid of it? Well, what's it telling me? What sort of expression? All right, let, let me do this. And then it's done. And you can burn the bloody thing if you yes. want. Right, you could. You could burn it or you could look for sale. <laughs> so, I feel like I would feel bad. But see, that's the head probably talking to put that onto someone else. Yeah, you, well, you, I mean, that's, that's personal to you. I mean, I would just do them and put them aside. People would come into my studio, what do you have? I said, oh, I've got this, that, that. And they would go, oh, I like that. And I'm like, fine. But if you burn it, you really let go of that energy. Right. Goes up, yeah. Well, as, as soon as you do any painting, you let go of the painting. Like, I won't, I won't, yeah. um, I, I love what I do. I've always loved the paintings. I love seeing them in their setting. I like it when I go visit the home and they're, they're there. I see what it does to the room, but am I emotionally attached to them? No. Yeah. no. Only the ones that I have actually kept for myself. But otherwise, they're meant, they're meant to be, they're meant to be gone. And used but if you're still else. emotionally attached to it, you, right. you haven't really let go. Well, those, those are with me at home. Those, yeah. are, those are the ones that I keep for myself. Um, they still have they still have like information that I'm, I'm looking at and yeah. things like that. Um, yeah. yeah. I, and also, over the years, honestly, I've sold so much stuff that I just like I need to keep some pieces for myself. I'm kind of getting there. Like I want my own collection um, mm -hmm. of things. You know, just family heirlooms also things like that. But normally, no. It's like it's done. I'm always like, who's who's gonna get this piece? I'd like to see what kind of sort of personality connects with that. And, um, and as my pieces have been getting lighter and lighter and lighter, as I've been embedding more light into them, the people buying them tend to be of a much lighter nature also. So it's interesting correlation to see it. You become in like super happy, dressed in, dressed in bright color, and uh, mind you, this for they're like, yay, I'm not the other. So does that make sense? The, uh, yeah? Yes. Mm -hmm. We're talking about uh, how um, emotion equates, happy emotion equates to bright color. Um, dark might be you're going through some type of physical ailment or mental thing in your life. Um, so what do you think about Rothko's work where he was exactly the opposite, mm -hmm. where when he was incredibly angry, incredibly depressed, he painted with very mm -hmm. bright colors, yeah. and it wasn't until later in his life where he started to feel more at peace that he did the Chapel series, which is black. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes right now. <coughs> Seriously, close your eyes. All right, I'm going to ask you, what do you see inside? You're going to see a light. Focus on your heart, and you're going to see a light appear. Uh, it could take three days for some people, but that's the point. <laughs> and that's what Rothko painted. So Rothko internalized, and he went inside, and then he brought it right back out again. So the chapel series is exactly that. It's like walking into a, sitting in a Quaker uh, church, and you just, just go in. And so there's a sense of stillness. So now we're even beyond the attributes of a physical manifestation. Now you're really into your zone of, of being connected to the divine. And that's the brilliant, brilliant part of Rothko. And whoever decided to turn it into a chapel was even more brilliant because they saw, they saw the, the scope and the depth of his work. Yeah. And what you see in Rothko's work is that split second every time before the sun, and I see this in Florida all the time, before the sun disappears beyond the horizon, and there's a few seconds right there, and then this, we have like a flash, brief flash, sometimes we call it and it goes this way, sometimes we don't, it just disappears. It is an instant of about a minute or so where there's absolute stillness where you don't know if it's dawn, all right, if it's evening, if it's right morning, you just don't know. And for a while, your brain is messing with you and you're like, no, it's okay, it's, it's sunset. And then, you know, of course, the mind comes back again. But there's that space right there where you're right in between. And that's sort of what we're made of, and that's where we're all going up with. Which I thought, that's funny that you said that. That was my first major aha moment 
in my quest to understand Rothko. Driving down the Lincoln Memorial, Milwaukee, mm -hmm. 5.30 in the morning, the sun was, wasn't was up yet. It was just about to come up. Right. And all of a sudden, yeah. bing, yeah. I framed it out and I thought, oh my God, yeah. there it is. There it is. And it yeah. changed everything for me. It, cha it does, it changed mm -hmm. everything because then it's, you know, there, that's when you have a heart opening, you know. I remember being at a stoplight one day and I'm at a stop sign and I'm just sitting there and coming back from my studio. A split second, I just said, holy shit, we're never going to die. I'm like, what? Okay, we are, we are never ever going to die because we're eternal beings. So this is temporary, but what's really deep inside just goes on forever. I'm like, that's awesome. All right, light changed and I kept going. Right. So, <laughs> next thing you know, my entire painting landscape changed. My approach to painting, everything changed. Everything. Right. So if that's, that's really what we're made of, then that's the connection that we all share. So we're all really connected universally. So if I paint from that point of understanding, then there's no way that I can't penetrate the hearts of other people because they're also in the sea spot that I'm in. Wow, that's easy. All right, let's go. You see what I'm saying? So you have these aha moments that occur in your life. Like, David, when you had yours, you look at that, you're like, okay, now I get it. All right, so that's being out of your head. That split second like that, you're out of your head and you're in your heart. And you end up having one of these moments like that. Not all of you have. Some of you have probably not taken note of it. And when those things happen, you ask yourself, how can I put that in my art? How can I express that so other people can feel what I'm feeling? Because that's a language. That's part of your story. That becomes your language. And that started to develop that. We were talking about that yesterday. Mm -hmm. David, what's your language? I have my language, right? So you have a narrative. So what is your narrative? Oh, no, this is the, the, I'm, I'm giving you a lot of stuff here. <laughs> you only have three days. I'm moving you up. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, one of the beautiful things, too, is to take it one step further. And you know, with Rothko's work, that you know, for me, I saw it in a landscape. But that's not what his work is. His work is really human. Um, you have the earth, the body, the heart, the mind, and the heavens. And that's why he's divided all of his compositions into squares and rectangles and things. I've always found it interesting from that point on that the light, that thing that Carmelo was explaining, and you know, as a sunset, for me, it's just before the sun comes up. That's always at the heart level. Mm -hmm. In his paintings, yeah. it's yeah, it's right there. It's yeah. right there, and oh, I just got goosebumps. So when you see his work in person, and you start to understand more about him and his growth as a painter. And you think about this: he was doing this um, World War II era. Um, it just—that's what brought the center of the art world to the United States, yeah. and yeah. changed everything. So, if you don't understand abstract expressionism, because we're all learning, you know, literal art, you know, representational art, do yourself a favor and never shut your mind off to it, because that's where a lot of the truth lies. Yeah. And it scares the heck out of most people. Um, because it's like the structure that they're, that they're accustomed to see. The figurative aspect of it is what's missing, for that the part that they can relate to, whether it be a structure or a human being or an object, it's not in there. Right. So where where am I going with this? Like, whoa, this is kind of freaking me out. <laughs> it just starts to happen. That's the mind. You know, that's the mind. But you're right. I mean, the Rothko's paintings are like incredibly zen. So um, there's a Japanese photographer um, who basically took Rothko's paintings and inspired himself by the sunsets. And he did, his work was all in black and white, and he was able to reproduces Rothko's paintings by looking at actual landscapes and sunsets. And then you, you look at that, you're like, wow, this is, this is pretty cool. You know? So your inspiration is there. You just have to be able to, to be open to it and to see it. Yeah. Any questions? So when, when you're putting together a uh, portrait, because all of you are doing figure to work, right? How do you know how to place it in a figure so that it has, it has a structure that creates a strong composition? What, what, are, what are some of your guidelines? What, what do you use? You want third, two thirds? 
Does that sound familiar? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Uh, do you understand the, uh, how to direct your eye across the composition so that you have golden means ratio in there? Mm -hmm. Now we're going to get heavy. We're moving out of the heart and we're going to get into the head a little bit. So, in, in, uh, in painting flowers, uh, we can approach the flowers in a variety of ways, but keep yourself in a safe zone for the next three, three days, right? And you either put them in a vase, right, because it's something you can relate to, right? Or you have them dispersed in your canvas, which is a little more difficult, but if you want the challenge, we are going to talk about that. And then you have to kind of figure out a way so that you allow for the eye to move across on the page and you have to keep me engaged. Right? Now you as the artist, one of the, um, one of the good things about being an artist is that you are assuming the role of, um, I'll give you the analogy to something that you can all relate to, uh, making a movie. All right? So you are, you are writing the movie, you are composing the movie, you are directing, directing is very important, the movie. You're choosing your cast of characters in the movie. Who are your cast of characters in a, in a painting when you're painting flowers? The flowers. Those are, your, those are your characters. Those are the characters in your movie, that's right. So your script is going to be part of your composition and the color scheme that you're going to have going on. The direction is literally you directing the viewer as to going from here. Now I want your eye to go here. I want your eye to go here, and then you're going to go here, and then you're going to go here and here, and you're never going to leave. The, you're never going to leave the structure. So, so, and then we have the cast of characters, and then we have what we call the the engagement level, the actual narrative of the story. Like, how interesting is your story? What are you telling me with this? Okay, so that's quite a bit. Should I, should we write them down again? All right. So think, think of it as a movie, movie analogy, right? So you are writing the script, okay? and the script will involve, let's say, style, color, dynamics. And part of the script will have the cast of characters. Okay? And then here you're going to have what we call big flowers small flowers, and background. Big flowers, best supporting actor mm -hmm. and actress, correct? They lead the show. Mm -hmm. without, the, without the small flowers or the supporting cast, right? These people would never shine, right? Makes sense, right? Think about it. So you have protagonist, antagonist, you know, you have the triangle going on over here, and then you have your background. What's your background? Your background is the foliage, the leaves, the stems, part of the background of where if you have it on the tabletop, it's a setting, a vase. Those are the back, that's part of the background. The background holds the small flowers, okay, which is the supporting cast, and the small flowers make the big flowers shine. All right? You can see a Julia Roberts movie, Julia Roberts, Richard Gere, the headline. Everybody else around it is a supporting storyline that makes them shine, and then the setting where it actually takes place, or the hotel room, or the city, that's, uh, that's your background, that's, that's your story right there, except rather than being on celluloid and going from, you know, one, it's, it's not moving this way in the dynamics, it's still, and you're telling everything in a still frame, so everything is happening this way, and you're penetrating this way. Whereas on celluloid, you start here, celluloid, and then you go over here, so you have a timeline. In art, that timeline doesn't exist. This is why if you look at a Van Gogh that was painted, you know, a hundred years ago, it still has the same impact when you look at it today. The timeline is embedded within the actual structure. It's, it's more quantum, you understand? You're, you're going into the painting this way and it's giving you feedback this way. You can't read a painting from left to right and it'll tell you the entire story. Make sense? Okay. So you have the cast of characters, the script, and then you have the director. What does that director do in the movie? It basically uh, gives, uh, gives you direction in, uh, in the scene. So the director plans out that whole thing. It says we are going to do the scene where basically we're walking into the room 
and then we're going to go over here, and then we're going to go over here, and then we're going to sit down, and we're going to implement certain things within there that are going to keep the focus of these, of these characters within that room. Okay? You all take it for granted because you go see a movie where you're not thinking about that. But this is what you guys are doing all the time every time you paint. It's just it's not on a movie. You're actually doing it as a painting. When you write music, it's the same thing. You're actually writing music in a certain way so that it keeps you focused within those three seconds of, of sound and melody, right? You have the harmony, you have the main, uh, main melody, right? You have the entire structure, it's all in there. And you have the direction of the, of the music. It takes you from here to here to here to here. And then at the end, usually what happens here, they loop you back to what happened here originally. So this brings you right back up to here and you repeat the song all over again. And then you're back here and then you do it all over again. So think about it. This is what's happening every time you look at it. You're just not even realizing that it's happening to you. So are you putting that in your painting? That's a question I'm asking you. Like Paul Clay or Kandinsky, kind of? Like yeah, that. Kandinsky was a brilliant for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, that kind of applies to all creative pursuits. Writing, yeah. music, movies. Architecture. Yeah. Architecture, the way you walk into a home. Right. Mm -hmm. The displacement of the rooms. Your, the relationship of your body to the entire room. All right. Has to be figured out. Because obviously, there's a reason why we have door handles at this level. And then out of here. Right? Think about the structure. Well, right. <laughs> why are windows why are windows like this? And they're not here because it'd be like, okay, I, I can open the door now, I can go through it. It's awkward. It's awkward. So this is all part of the human design, the configuration of our structure embedded within a building and how we relate to the movement within. Somebody had to think of that. Mm -hmm. So this is but this is nature. This is just natural, right? So somebody, they took that, what basically remember movies came after paintings. So that was already in the structure of painting. And movie directors and movie producers looked at paintings and said, we're gonna take this thing and we're gonna stretch it over two hours. Artists said, no, we're gonna take this thing and we're gonna keep it here and we're gonna integrate it for hundreds of years. Do you see the power of the image, a single image, like how far it can go? And so you'll watch the movie and then you're gonna be like, yeah, the movie was good, but did you like it? Eh, it was so-so. Why? I don't know. It had a strong start, but towards the end, it kind of felt weak. Oh, yeah, you're right. I felt that too, right? That it was good in this scene, but it wasn't that good in that scene. So what happened? What do you think happened there? How many, how many of you have seen crappy movies? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Didn't keep your interest in there. Why did it not keep your interest? The heart Composition. Composition. The composition. The actual composing. The composition, mm -hmm. the composing of the paint of the film had weak points. It basically had areas where the energy of the film started to slip out this way. Or they introduced two separate storylines and they tried to make it all into one and it doesn't work. There's a weakness, right? So you have two asymmetrical spaces coming together in the movie and it weakens the movie. Right? Then there's the opposite. You look at some movies and you're like, I want to watch that movie again. That was damn good. You know, two weeks later, you watch it again. Ten years later, you're watching it again. You discuss it with your friends. That was solid. That was amazing. Because the composition was tight. Like, so tight. You, could, you can't break away from that movie and it stays with you. So, case in point, I take you back to the Metropolitan. I put you in front of the Van Gogh. You're not going to leave his paintings. And it's some of the simplest paintings you've ever seen. It's just a bloody vase on the table. And you're like, wow, like, why, why am I mesmerized by this? Why am I not so mesmerized by Christ being pulled down on the cross in the Caravaggio? Like, because it doesn't have the same structure. It doesn't have the same embedded life force that's in there. That's, think of it. Like when you watch movies, that's, that's right there for you to look at. When you listen to a piece of music, you like certain music because it keeps you coming back. There's a loop. That's a compositional thing, but that's where so, it's So when the ending of a movie really sucks, is that like your focal point sucking, your main character? Yeah. Is the end of the movie, the climax, your focal point, and then... So that's Somewhere along the way, something got lost. Something got lost. Part of that structure became weakened. And like, it's like any, any foundation, if that foundation is not strong, you can keep piling on top of it and it's going to crumble. It only has a certain amount of time before it falls apart. And you know, because you know, again, it's either, either it gets too heavy 
or it doesn't have enough art, or the direction, which is the production part, was not structured properly. Writing is the same way you brought up the sample of writing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you read a good book and it starts off pretty good, halfway through you're like, this sucks, man. Mm -hmm. I'm just wasting my time here. I'm not, I'm not gonna do this. You look at art pieces, you're like, oh yeah, okay. Then, wow, you make a dash to that one. But what's the difference? Have you ever questioned, like, why? So these is, these, I'm bringing this up because this is part of your, like, your lexicon, your narrative moving forward. You're not gonna see things the same anymore. Now you're gonna start looking for that. When you're gonna go to the Met or any kind of museum, you're gonna be like, and I've had this happen with all my students. They report back and they're like, thanks for messing with my head. Because now it's like, I can't see, I can't do what you said. And they see it everywhere, everywhere. And, and it's just gonna reinforce all the work you're doing here. It's gonna reinforce all the work you're gonna be doing afterwards. Okay.